It was Saturday night last night, wasn't it? And yep. Too much beer. Okay, I'm going to hand you over. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Miles, and uh, we started the Basis Project in. Uh, who's got the clue? Anybody read the program? Yeah. 1984. Well, smart arse here, Gary from Northern Ireland. He's the son of a mate of mine who built the pirate stations all those years ago. Um, spotted it first because he's smart. Yeah, it was 1994 that we first uh, interviewed Barry King, which started the Bases series. That's why it's called Bases, because it's about underground bases in England, making programmable generated life forms. Anybody here today, but not yesterday? Any new people? Great, great. Okay, uh, basically programmable generated life forms, um, i.e. the being, which is on the Bases Project logo, are manufactured beings allegedly from World War II, which is the start of this cycle of humanity's existence creating the greys. <clears throat> We've got researchers in the background that essentially the Germans started to create beings which could be controllable and take grey souls for the purposes of uh, creating a slave humanity because we have a predator with us in human form, which is why so many things are wrong. This affects agriculture, the weather, uh, poisons in our food, all sorts of things. And um, the purpose of this series of conferences is to try and explain that, but the bottom line is that we have to take action carefully, because we're all under surveillance now. Everything we do is monitored, and everything that's going on is being scanned or looked at by somebody. As you know, we don't have a tax disc after October because it's number plate recognition is now all across the place, the, the country. That being is called AN, it's got a designation, it's a, it's, it's, it is terrestrial, it's not alien, it's about this high, and its message is don't become like us. The way things are looking, we've got about three generations left. Yesterday we had Mary Rodwell talking about the children and about how they're being attacked, these new children coming up with so many abilities. The Sasquatch in the past, the Sasquatch or the proto-human left here originally because we're all seeded from other places. And again, this is a complicated issue. We won't repeat ourselves. The main thing is we've got to wake up, smell a coffee, take action, but do so carefully. Now, uh, one reason we've got Gary Heseltine here and Ben here and myself, because in 2010 our collective lives began to change quite dramatically, because it would appear that our particular files were taken out of the drawer. And our respective careers and pathways were, shall we say, creatively engineered, so we had to maybe do this, what we're doing now. Uh, so we have to use our talents and abilities and abilities to make this work. It's going to take real money, real efforts, because the two main attempts to try and get this done uh, haven't really worked. It's got to be hard-nosed, pulled together, financed, and pushed forward. And there's a variety of ideas about that. Anyway, that's my little five minutes. Uh, I welcome Gary Hesseltine from UFO Truth magazine, which is a revamp of the original uh, UFO magazine. And I disagree. That, yeah, I disagree. great, great. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you, Miles. Just set my timer going because I've only got an hour. Good morning. Thank you, Miles, for inviting me here. Okay. Um, have many people in this room seen me lecture before? Stick your hands up if you have. Can't really see a few. Stick your hands up if you haven't seen me lecture before. All right, please leave. Right, only joking. Right. My lecture today is called UFO Truth Magazine, Why You Should Subscribe. Now, that's, now you might be thinking this is just a sales ploy. Well, it is in a way, but it's not in another way. Because it's a very serious thing that I'm going to talk about. Okay, let me just... Uh, Go to the first slide. Has it changed yet? Right. Is it coming up on the screen yet, Miles? Yes. Ah, there we go. Right. 
I like to be a bit animated and ask questions of my audience. All right, so stick your hand up if you used to subscribe or buy the printed magazine by Graham Birdsell. All right, quite a few of you. Now, put your hands down, thank you. Now, realistically, and very sadly, Graham Birdsell died at the age of 49 of a brain hemorrhage, suddenly, in 2000, September 2003. And the magazine continued for another six months until his wife, Christine, decided that she couldn't cope with it anymore and she pulled the plug, took it off the high street, and uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a, not a nice way, really, there was no closure. People suddenly just had no magazine. There was no explanation given or anything like that. Now, that's the politics of that, but the reality is that in 2004, we lost our position on the high street in W. H. Smith's fourth shelf every month, get a printed magazine. Now, how many people know that at the time that that magazine closed in 2004, there were 11,000 readers? in 44 countries. Where did those people go? Think about that. 11,000. Think about that number as we go on in this presentation. Now, in the interim, and I said at the time, because I'd got to know Graham Bird so well in the last two years of his life because he was on my doorstep and I was in, based in Leeds as a police detective, and he moved to a place called Sturton, which is a suburb of Leeds. And he was a tea stop for me. I'd go call in and I got to know him. Okay. That's when I was beginning to get drawn into this subject in terms of being a researcher and investigator. Now, I said at the time, when I went to his funeral, there were loads of people from all around the world that went, that it, put, it was going to put ufology back in the UK at least 10 years. Now, I had no idea in 2004 when I said that what effect that would have on my life. But I think it's pretty accurate what I said. Because that was the premier magazine, arguably, the world has ever seen. Is a popular, glossy magazine. And everybody says, oh, what a great magazine it was. And I don't know of anybody that said it was a poor magazine. It was a really well-established magazine. And then there was nothing. So to fill the void, I without any kind of training background in writing or in terms of putting a magazine together, I thought we've got to do something to carry on his work. So what I did is I instantly created UFOMonthly.com, which was an e-zine effectively 10 years ahead of its time. Now, I was still a police officer, so realistically, there was only certain things I could do because I had to move within certain constrictions of the job. So it was never going to be very big. It was more of a hobby. But it's where I cut my teeth on learning how to, to put articles together, graphics and things like that. So again, it, it, it's kind of like played a part in my life that's later on come to the fore. Now, realistically, that ran for three and a half years, but it was only small and it was a hobby. But what was there in the mainstream? There was nothing. We had things like uh, UFO data came along. Russell Callahan, who had been the right-hand man to Graham Birdsell, I think around 2007, uh, launched UFO Data, which was a subscription-based printed glossy magazine. And it wasn't bad. This was running at the same time as my internet magazine. And eventually he said to me, let's join forces for the good of the subject, and uh, you can be co-editor. And I always wanted to have a printed magazine again, so I said yes, so I became the co-editor. But in reality, Russell being Russell, he wasn't the easiest person to work with as a partner. I.e. he was unreliable. And I'm not here to slag people, but that was the case. And in the latter six months of that, I didn't see him for six months. Now, you can't run a magazine like that. The magazine, that magazine, I think in 2009, suddenly disappeared. He ran all the finances and then suddenly disappeared. Again, no explanation given. Well, I think a lot of people lost their subscriptions. Now to him left a bad feeling. Okay? So then we come across UFO Matrix. UFO Matrix, printed magazine that you could buy in the high street, 2010, 2011. And yeah, I think it ran for about eight or nine issues. It wasn't bad. And at least it was something in print. 
But then, that too fell by the wayside. And then, of course, in 2013, or 2012, as I was thinking about retiring from the police, retiring early, six years early, because something was compelling me to get involved even in an even bigger way, I had the idea of creating an online magazine. But this time, bigger, better, because my life had moved on. I started in 2002 by creating a database for police officers. That's how I became known in ufology. Graham Birdsell was the catalyst, the editor, of, the editor of UFO magazine, was the person who I regard as my mentor because he gave me the opportunity to launch that database publicly in his magazine in January 2002. So I owe him the debt of gratitude. And he allowed me to have that platform which says, look, I'm creating a database for police officers, will you send me your reports? And they did. And I started with six cases involving 10 officers, and 12 years later I now have over 500 cases involving over 1,000 British police officers. That's a lot. So there is, and it is, and it worked. But something also was ticking away in me that said, I must do more. Don't know why, but something tells me I must do more. So in 2012, at the ExoPolitics conference in Liverpool, I had the idea of approaching many of the world's top researchers who I'd met during that intervening period, as I'd become known within the UFO field, and saying, would you write for an English-speaking easy that's going to be a little bit different, with a concept of trying to bring people in from around the world, top researchers, all under one roof, and we put forward our best evidence to the people. Okay? So that's how it came about. The next step is March uh, 2013. I retire from the police, purposely to set up the magazine and launch it as an easy. Why not a printed magazine? Because I ain't got the money. And the money is the key to all of this subject. I was quoted 50 to 100,000 pounds to set up a printed high street magazine with no guarantee of success because it is a specialist magazine and two, you've got to secure your house against it. Don't really like those odds. And so many magazines had failed. But there was a significant difference. And this is the significant difference. The invention of the smartphone and tablet technology. Now, when I first started UFOMonthly.com in 2004, all you could do was create a PDF, no matter how nice it looked, it would only be on your laptop, so you'd have to scroll it and whatever. It wasn't really user-friendly. People effectively hated to read off a computer screen. A lot of people still do. But what significantly changed with these things is e-books built in within it. So now we're quite happy to read our pages, to expand it, minimize it, look at the graphics, watch our videos on tablets and smartphones. So do we need to have a printed cost? No, we don't. And on, it, on Amazon, e-books have overtaken printed books. And that is the way it's going. Yes, it's very nice to have printed books. It's very nice to have printed magazines. But with them come the associated costs. But now we have a technology that allows us to carry thousands of books on your Kindle, your Kobo, or whatever, and just read like a book. Thousands of books. Without having to carry this big library around with you. So really the technology is there that we could create a magazine as an easy. Okay? So that's how I started it. Thinking we don't need the overheads. Is it changing the screen? There we go. Now, why do I want to create a magazine? Because I want to do something a little bit different. Do I want to make loads of money? No. I mean it because I want a flash car? No. Do I want a swimming pool? Yes. But I can't afford one. But realistically, money, I don't give a shite about money. Sorry about swearing. But I really aren't in it for the money. I want to make a difference. And this is a concept that we'll be talking about. A concept that you can either choose to buy into, or you can walk away and still have your moans and groans. Okay, now I'll explain. 
Now, just before I talk about these three things, how many people in this room believe that ET, in whatever form you want to call it, light beings, interdimensional, whatever, who believes that ET exists and is engaging with planet Earth now? Put your hands up if you do. All right. That, that's the majority. Thank you. Who doesn't think that at the moment? Oh, please don't put my hand up and embarrass me. Right, so overwhelmingly you all do. All right, so here's the disconnect. How many people do you get and subscribe to UFO Truth magazine? Stick your hand up. Mm, two, three, four, five, big disconnect there, isn't there? So really it's, there's a failure of, of knowledge there and what I'm about and what I'm trying to do. It's not just about creating a magazine that goes, oh, thanks very much. In my pockets, swim the pool next year. Now, when we look at this subject, all of us, I think, recognise in this room that the world in which is, it, is how it is presented in the mainstream is not actually the world as it really is. Do we agree with that? And we all mourn about, oh, when we're going to get disclosure. Oh, the lie about this, the baby, oh, let's watch Russia television, oh, it's a lot better. Don't we? We all mourn about these things. But the reality is, can we actually do anything to affect change? No, I think we can. Everybody pretty much recognises that these three major topics are being suppressed from the public. Now, people have different views on different things. But we've all basically said that we think ET is real, but that's not accepted in the mainstream, is it? So that's a big give for us that says UFOs is, is kept now. But I would say 9-11, very certainly, in my opinion, as a police detective of many years, that there's so many anomalous things wrong with the evidence as presented in the official version, that there should be a major reinvestigation of the whole thing. And I would have to conclude as a detective, in my opinion, they allowed it to happen to create a Pearl Harbor effect to do get into Iraq. Yeah? Now I think a lot of people think that, but if you say that in the mainstream, you are suppressed. You are, oh, you can't say that way. No, no. And directly related to UFOs, and in fact, in some ways, it might even be above UFOs, or side by side with it, we talk about, we believe, people in this room believe that there's a probably reversed engineering from crashed UFOs, and that there really is probably great technology out there that's 50, 60 years developed to go for reverse engineering, that we don't need jet engines, we don't need petrol-driven cars, etc., etc. Patents bought, never heard of again. The oil companies don't want you to invent a car that runs on fresh air because they lose their revenues. And there's a, big, there's a big key denominator in all of this, and it's greed and money. Does that make sense? It's not in the interest for me to invent a car that runs on fresh air because all that millions and billions of revenue from the oil companies is going to be lost. Oh, it don't cost anything to make it on fresh air. Ooh. I don't want to lose the profits. And man, the, the quirk of mankind's makeup is that we're inherently greedy, selfish, in a proportion. And these top people become greedy and power corrupts, etc., etc. So, when we talk about suppression, is there a suppression in the mainstream? And how effective has their suppression been, political? then through the media to back it up, how effective has it, has it been? Fantastically effective. For 60 years since the Robertson panel in 1953, CIA commissioned. Get all the top scientists in. What did they say? It's in black and white. We want to strip the aura of flying saucers. We want to work with the media to dumb down the subject. And by God did they do that. Because you think about it, in the early years, in the 40s, early 50s, there was a genuine interest, not only by the public who were seeing things, 
but by the media. And think about what Eisenhower said in his closing speech in 1960. And he warned of the, the threat of the military-industrial complex. That he could see then as president in 1960 that we were losing control to the intelligence community and big corporate business. And I would hazard a guess that when he went, he was the last person that ever had any real control. And we have totally, in the years that have followed, lost control to the intelligence communities of the world, American-led. And we are in this situation where it's not prime ministers who really make the decisions, it's the private corporations and this kind of Illuminati, Bilderberger group, that kind of thing. They have power and influence because of this, money. And that is the key thing. So they have been fantastically effective at suppressing this. Do you agree? So how do we change things? Well, let's look at the nature of suppression. Let's look at what they actually achieved. Over 60 years, they achieved this. We're all frightened to talk about it. I won't say anything in public, because if I do, you think I'm a nutter. How effective is that? 60 years, they've created this fear. Unless you're in this kind of a environment where you're like-minded, people you can relax and you're not criticised, you're not judged. So what else have they done? They've created that climate of fear. In my work with police officers, two things that have come out time and time again. Fear of ridicule as primary and secondary, a perceived risk to their career if they speak out. Wow, that's good suppression, that, isn't it? without anybody ever doing anything. They've created such a powerful weapon against us. And it works. What also have they done? They've also created a subliminal fear, which a lot of people don't realise. So, from 1953 onwards, for definite, other than your parents, from the day you are born, which... I would think virtually everybody in this room, right? Where do you get your information from? Media, television, radio, newspapers, books. Now, if all that media, radio, television, newspaper, books is saying there is nothing to this subject, <laughs> it's a bit kooky, then without you ever picking up a UFO book, the man on the street ever, ever looking at the subject, subliminally, that message has been bred into them. That if they're asked a random question, do you believe in flying saucers? <laughs> well, I think it's just a trick of the light. Meteorology. Atmospheric. Mistakes. That's what they've been fed on. And you can't blame the public for thinking that, can you? You really can't blame the public. Because it's not their fault. That's what society and media is telling them. Is it not? Let's look at ufology itself. Ufology, some people don't like the word ufology. I personally do, because straight away we know what we're talking about. We're talking about UFOs. Is it science? No, not really, but blah, blah, blah. It does sum up the word, I think, about what we're about. But the, but the subject of ufology, historically, if you follow this subject and done a little bit of history on the subject over the years, is fundamentally flawed. Why is it flawed? Because generally, a group will be there, UFO group will be over there, my group's better than your group, I don't like your group, I'm not talking to you, blah, blah, blah. Historically, that's how it's been. <sighs> you love me. You love me. Gary Hazeltine's fantastic. He's the history. The Stephen Gray's of this world. Oh, uh, well, if you come into the desert, for give me five thousand dollars, I will talk to E.T. <laughs> Turns himself almost into a demigod. Which is a real shame because his original idea of the Disclosure Project was fantastic. 
high caliber witnesses. Collectively, the UFO community over the last 60 years of this subject fails miserably to unite together in a single force and show its best evidence. Now, I've, I've suggested a while ago that when the... Uh, how many times have you heard this expression where the, the newspaper go, well, is there any evidence? Is there any evidence? There's no evidence. That's what they say, isn't it? But if we did our job properly, we should be saying to that question, take it to the UFO evidence bank. A bit like the money. Let's create a, like a museum or a bank where every researcher in the world wants to have investigated a case that really stands up to scrutiny, that's in that 3% unknown after investigation. They send copies of all that documentation, photograph, video, and it goes in one repository, the best evidence bank. So when the reporter goes, there's no evidence, we go, go to the bank. Oh, wow. If they're prepared to do that. Does that make sense? We don't show our best evidence. Disconnects. There are incredible disconnects with this subject. After pornography, of which I'm sure you've never even heard the word, or never looked. Um, that's the men I'm watching, right? Okay. Internet. They say that the most searched keywords after pornography is UFOs, flying saucer, alien abduction, aliens. So in theory, that means that there are literally hundreds of millions, if not billions, of hits at UFO websites. Which in kind of infers that there are hundreds, if not hundreds of millions, who are interested in this subject. But here we are on a lovely sunny morning, not, in Marlborough, and there's less than a hundred people here. Can I not, not people see the massive disconnect between the actual interest in the subject, but it doesn't transpire in its effect. All those hundreds of millions of people who are genuinely interested in the subject, it doesn't translate into numbers who create a movement that actually have any power or could wield any power. That's a terrible disconnect. And I think it's because of the reasons that I've just said. We just don't organize. Here's a question that always comes up to me. Where are the young people who are interested in this subject? Now, just a straw poll, put your hand up in the room if you are under the age of 25. One gold star, one person out of 75 people, perhaps. Put your hand up if you are over the age of 45, be honest ladies. Put your hands down, almost well over three quarters. That is a massive disconnect. Why is it when computer games, science fiction com based computer games earn billions with millions of players that science fiction in the cinema, big films, big hits, but none of these people are here, we're doing something wrong. When I went to Laughlin for the first time to the last Laughlin World Conference in 2010. We were in a big room and it was like a big ballroom and you could have got a thousand, two thousand people in, but there were probably about 700 people in the room. But the average age was 60 plus. And I was physically shocked. And that's, that's, that really struck a chord with me that we are not connecting with young people at all. And yet everybody kind of says this probably the most exciting subject in the world. Why? Because it affects the world. How many subjects can affect the world, really? Well, everybody, even in mainstream, accepts that as and when contact is officially acknowledged, 
that this will be the biggest leap of man for mankind. So it is a really exciting subject, but we, it just doesn't connect, does it? We're not doing something right. The effect of the internet. Now, we kind of take it for granted, really. But just a few years ago, there was no internet. But seeing as there's no young people here, that's, that's a waste of time, isn't it? You just talk to the older people, that's us. For us, it was great. We had all this, you know, we could go on virtual tours of museums and we could look up it, um, encyclopedias. It was all, oh, it's fantastic. We've got videos that will play through your, your computer screen. How oh, fantastic. And it is fantastic. Well, what has the effect of the internet been? We've created this. And some of you in this room actually might be armchair experts. There's nothing wrong with that. But the people in this room who come here and get off their ass, oh, Sunday morning, I can't be asked to go. Oh, yeah, it's interesting. It's going to be good. I'll get out of bed and I'll make the effort to go to a conference and put in my two penny and listen. You're to be applauded. 75 people. Billions of people around the world interested in this subject. Massive disconnect. So what we, the internet has created without us realising is it's, and it's not just UFOs, but in our subject, this is a major problem in my opinion. It's created this legion. <sighs> oh, that's rubbish, that. Oh, no, no, that's a drone. Oh, what do you know about it? They put slag people off. Oh. No real conversation, just, oh, Europe, Europe. It's like children playing. Do you see what I'm saying? It's created these armchair experts who have never got off their backside. Never actually rang up a witness. But they're the experts. And that's no wrong with that. But you've got to realise that that's one of the effects. Because in creating the millions of armchair experts, it's created this. Apathy. Oh, I can't be asked to bring up a witness. Oh, but I'm a UFO expert. I'm an armchair UFO expert. Oh, but I can't be bothered to do a real investigation. I'll just read about what others do. Is that not what the armchair expert does? Just gets their information from the internet. Don't actually do anything with it, but just becomes this self pointing expert. No wrong with that. But you've got to accept that what it's created is legions. Millions, I think, of apathetic people. Because it's made it all so easy. I can just go in there. Don't like that side, I'll just go in there. Don't like that side, I'll go in there. Oh, I like that side. Well, I'll have a bit of that information. It's all so easy. So they don't need to get off the backside. They don't need to go to conferences because I am the UFO expert. See what I mean? And that's the problem, that's the disconnect. And how are we going to get these people on board? And I'm not sure what the answer to that is. Because that's the downside to the internet. Mostly the internet is great. But we have to recognise that that is a massive downside for our subject. Thank you for that laughter. Have you ever wondered why we scrat around for money for conferences and here we are, we're lucky if we can draw 100, 200 people a day when there's such a massive interest have you not ever wondered why we haven't got secret financial backers think about it the Robbie Williams of this world turn up at the conferences, the world conferences yeah, yeah, I, I saw you before, yeah, yeah David Bowie, yeah, I belonged to a UFO club when I was a teenager. Now, if you had an experience, and if you uh, cared about this subject, really, and you wanted to affect some kind of change, I think you'd do something about it. Would you not? Because especially in light of all the suppression and the media and things like that, we wouldn't be just happy to see all the suppression going on. So the likes of Robbie William just change in his pocket. Gary, you're sure of Truth Magazine, I like the idea of that, or anybody. He could approach anybody. I don't want to go public. 
I'm a silent partner, you can't mention my name, but I want to make a difference. I want to help you. There's 50 grand, there's 100 grand, there's a million pounds. Small change to somebody who was multiple millions. But they could affect change, couldn't they? But they don't, do they? So that tells me they're not really interested. But isn't it really amazing that when this disconnect says that there's millions of people who've had experiences all around the world, are you telling me there are not millionaires who've had abduction experiences, contact experiences, sightings? Don't make sense. They will have. And what they should be doing is putting their hand into the pocket silently to promote a change in the subject. But they don't. And here we are scratching around, looking if we can cover the costs of conferences, etc. And most conferences run at a loss. That's true. Most conferences in the UK worldwide run at a loss. Because of this disconnect with the subject. So think about that. Why aren't there people helping us? Right. Let's now start looking around and turning it around. How can we start to challenge that? Something has to change. Now, all of you in this room pretty much, I think, believe that we're on the edge of a new awareness. And that's probably true. But in mainstream, our opinion counts for bugger all. And you're deluded in your belief if you think that we are making a difference. As it stands now, in my opinion. Deluded. We are not affecting anything. One jot. We are having no political power. Influence. One jot. In America, Stephen Bassett, great activist, is trying his best. But it's difficult. But we're not really making a change. And we're not making a change because of some of the reasons why I've said. But I think we can make a change. But it has to become, it has to start somewhere. And it has to be a belief in something. And I think that's the key secret. We know that there are millions, millions of people around the world who believe in E.T. now, is visiting the earth, in whatever context. We all believe that. But there's this disconnect. But really, I think we have it within ourselves to start something. And that's, forget all the differences, the petty differences, my club's better than your club, the big egos. But just to recognise that we're all fighting on the same side, to change something, to show the world that we're not kooks, and that there is real evidence to it. Okay? So the key thing is, we just accept that E.T. is here. That's the broad stroke that unites us all. And we start to affect change. How do we affect change? How do we reach out to the man on the street. All the people in this room are already self-aware, to a degree. The mere fact that you're here means you're self-aware, that things aren't quite as what they seem. But we're only a small number. The vast majority have still got the... Oh, didn't like that. That's bad. Sorry. Probably death now. Right? The reality is, is that the vast majority... Oh, I've knackered it now. Has it gone off? Oh, it's still on. Right, okay. The vast majority are still blinking. Still living in their 9 to 5 BBC world is the telling the truth world. Yeah? And what's wrong with that? And they're happy in that, because people don't like change, do we? None of us in life, whether we're at work, like lots of change, because we get used to the way things are. We just don't like it. It's just the nature of human beings. So my aim is not to reach the people in this room, because you're already self-aware. The fact that you're here is, you've done your own research to get here. I want to reach the man on the high street in Marlborough, who on Sunday morning... What do you think about you? You nutters. That's who I want to reach. So how do we reach them? Now, I guarantee that if you go with a camera 
and a microphone and go to Malba High Street and start stop people. Do you believe in light beings? Nutters. They'll just walk away. Do you believe in alien abductions? Nutters. Walk away. Do you believe in interdimensional beings? Do you believe in black goo? Nutters. Absolute nutters. And that is the real reaction in the mainstream world, isn't it? We're the nutters. We're not the enlightened ones. We're the nutters. They're the real people in the real world, in 95 BBC world. Big disconnect. So, in launching UFO Truth magazine, and that's not to say that I don't believe in interdimensional beings, light beings, light workers, things like that. Right? I'm not saying that those things don't exist. They're not my specialities, because it's such a diverse area. But I see my role as trying to start something a little bit different, a concept to try to affect a change, the broad stroke. And you cannot reach the man on the street by saying, do you believe in black goo? Did you know that there are little slave aliens, or slave creatures that's been created? They really are going to run a mile, I think we're all mad. And even miles will accept that this is the way to go. You have to reach the people on the street with things that they can understand. And they can understand a policeman, a bunch of policemen who've seen a UFO. Or some pilots, because we've all flown on planes, who've had multiple sightings in broad daylight. So what you go to them initially is with what's called the circumstantial evidence case for ET. And that is showing them the high caliber witness categories, the pilots, the astronauts, cosmonauts, senior military scientists, uh, senior military people, scientists, radar operators, ob observer corps, sonar operators, police officers, kind of like in that order, high caliber witnesses. And presenting our evidence uniformly in this best evidence bank that we create, which is all believable stuff that people, that's documented with photographs, investigation, witness testimony, documentary evidence, radar reports, uh, telemetry data reports, that kind of thing. Documentary, paper reports that you would produce in a court of law that would stand up in a court of law. We've got loads of that. But it's not in one place. It's all over the place. Or it's, I've got my records, but you're not looking at them. Because it's mine. Attitude. Well, I don't do any of this any good, does it? But the way to reach out to the man on the street in Marlborough is by giving me the best evidential case. By giving them the credible, credible evidence of these kind of people. Because you have to do something that makes them go, oh, oh, the blinkers are going off. Oh, it's bright out here. And they start to look at the world in a slightly different way. Does that make sense? You cannot just go in and say, light worker, light being, go, black go. It's real, you know. Oh, yeah. You can't do that. So we hit them with the best circumstantial evidence case. And in police terms, and given my background, I was a police officer for almost 24 years. Prior to that, I was in the Royal Air Force Police for six years. For, for about 19, 20 years, I was a detective working on all manner of inquiries, murder, manslaughter, rape. Worked on the London bombings inquiry. I was an advanced interview of suspects and witnesses at the highest level you could go. That was my bad interview. All right? I know what evidence is and what would stand up in a court of law. And that's how you reach it, with this circumstantial evidence case. Because if you put all this best evidence, that 3% that after investigation stands up to scrutiny, when everything else has been ruled out, we do have a repository of 3% of cases, of millions, 3% of millions of hardcore cases that stand up to scrutiny, stand up to investigation, that defy all explanations. But the media don't project that 3%, do they? They still talk about people going, um, mummy, um, mummy, um, mummy, um, mummy. Because that's what they want to present us, isn't it? They want to make us the fruit loads. They do, though, don't they? And we give them perfect opportunity to do so. You've got to understand that there are two domains 
The secret world and the public domain. The secret world, we will never have a clue what's going on. A real clue. Why? Because we don't have the need to know. We're not in those intelligence circles. We don't have the classification clearance. So we're never going to world. We're never really going to break into that. Yeah? So we're reliant upon the public domain. But we've still got 2,000 military pilots, 3,000 commercial pilots, hundreds of uh, uh, private pilots, uh, literally hundreds of radar operators, sonar operators, air traffic controllers that make up our body of evidence. The circumstantial case is overwhelming. When you go to court, and I often say this to people, that people don't realise that people have got sentenced to murder and life in, for, for murder, life imprisonment, and in, and in some cases historically hanging, when there's not even the body being found. Because we're able to produce in court a circumstantial case. And what that circumstantial case means, if we have enough pieces of the jigsaw, the jury can make an overwhelming and compelling argument, or the prosecution can make an overwhelming and compelling case to say that that person buried the body, did that, put it up, whatever. The people have been convicted in that way. So you don't always need direct evidence. A lot of police cases rely on the circumstantial evidence case. So why can't we use the same case to, to, to promote our cause, UFOs and suppression? When we review all that, as a police officer, I'm guaranteeing you that if we were to go into an artificial court of law scenario and we put up our best evidential case, that jury would convict and say that ET was real. And it's here now. Because we have enough good evidence to show the public. In fact, when I was at the citizens' hearings last year in Washington, D.C., how many were aware of the citizens' hearings? Stick your hand up if you're aware, and stick your hand up if you weren't aware. All right? Well, the citizens' hearing, for those that weren't aware, is, was a, uh, one of the rare times uh, some money has been donated. A, a rich guy called Thomas Clearwater in America gave Steve Bassett a million dollars to put the citizens' hearings together. And the citizens' hearings was to do a mock congressional hearing, two blocks from the White House at the Washington Press Club, very prestigious, where all the presidents have spoken, blah, 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 in front of a senator, a former senator, and five former congressmen and women. And the idea was to present witnesses, top researchers, to say what our best evidence is. And largely that happened. Media stayed at a in droves. But it was historical. It was done properly, and anybody that's seen it it was the best thing that I've ever been involved in because I spoke on police officers worldwide, which was a real honour for me. And I said to the panel after the end of my testimony, I said, you will be getting grief now, be mocked now, but in years to come, this will be seen as the catalytic step on the road to change. And I genuinely believe that that will be the case. So, let's look at the magazine. The magazine was created in June 2013, as I retired in the March. It's 96 pages, bi-monthly. Can't be monthly, because I do it all myself, in terms of putting it all together. Okay, so if you, put, if you were to do it monthly, you'd be on such a treadmill, I'd be dead in a year, two years. Okay, so it's not practical. But here's the key thing. Even at the height of um, UFO magazine, Graham Bertels magazine, when you look at the list of our contributors on a regular basis, regular columnists, when you look at the list of the calibre of the people who were witness, who were occasional contributors because they're busy writing books, doing tours, whatever, it's far outweighs anything that UFO magazine ever put together in terms of every issue. But for me, UFO magazine will always be my number one magazine because it was really important to me. But in essence, what you have now is effectively many of the world's top research researchers giving their time freely because they've united under the concept of an English-speaking easy 
We don't need print anymore. No overheads. And we can put our resources into creating the, what I think is a world-class publication. And the feedback is a world-class publication. Now, because of my police background, and because of my desire to reach the man on the street, you won't find in that magazine black goo. Why? Because if they look at it, they go, hey, won't even go beyond page two. It's not to say it doesn't exist. But you have to give them something that, that draws them in. So it's evidential based material. So we have lots of pilot cases, naval cases, military cases, documents, historical archive documents. This is real evidence that would stand up in a court of law. Now, what makes, I think, UFO Truth magazine a little bit different is that straight away, its mission statement, which is carried in every issue, says that a third of all monies raised through subscriptions is automatically ring-fenced for UFO causes. A third of all money. So that's like me setting up a business and saying I'm giving a third of my profits away. 33%. How many businesses would actually do that? You wouldn't, would you? You wouldn't give a third of your profits away. Five minutes. Five minutes. Oh, that's a shame you want me to. Right? So think about this. Let's just think about the numbers again. If we had 10,000 people, or, or just, um, all right, let's just use... A thousand people paying 16, well, let's use an easy number, 15 pounds a year, 35 pence a week, we end up with 15,000 pounds. Yeah? 1,000, 15 pounds a year, 15,000. Straight away, a third of that is ring fence. So straight away, there's a kitty of 5,000 pounds for UFO courses. Now let's do the numbers. What if there's 10,000? subscribers worldwide. Well, in the internet, 10,000 is a drop in the ocean, is it not? If it was any other kind of car magazine or something like that, they'd have hundreds of thousands of readers worldwide e -zines. So it's not fantastical, but 10,000 people paying 100, that's 150,000 pounds. That's a kitty of 50,000 pounds, automatically ring fence. Now, let's just say what we could do with 50,000 pounds. Well, when I launched it, I said the first thing that will happen is it will create a proper funding mechanism for UK ufology. And that has happened because it's, it's, it's funded the first magazine conference in November of last year. So we're not running at a loss, it's self-funding. And it's now financing a two-day conference next week in Holmford with five international speakers, nine speakers in total, eight grand budget, funded by the magazine. It's a mechanism. So we're not running at loss. But what happens if we have this 10,000, this 50,000 pot? Well, whew, I could have my swimming pool then, couldn't I? But that 50,000, I'm not in it for the money. I'd give all the money away. But realistically, what I've said is that when we get to 1,000, I think it's only right that the, subscriber, uh, the, the, the contributors get a 50-pound check for each article, or right? something like that. So they're putting their belief in me, all right? And then we give back. But personally, when we get to that thousand, and we're not there, we've got hundreds, but we're not thousands. But this is the concept that I'm launching. This is the first time I've ever done this speech. Because the concept is within us that if you extrapolate the numbers, what if we had 50,000 people worldwide? That's 250,000 pounds that we could start doing things. Well, what could we do with 250,000? We could go and start embarrassing the media with a media campaign. Why? What could we do? We could go to the Times and say, uh, how much for a full page ad? Five grand, sir. Oh, yeah, they're always trying to ring you. Yeah, we've got some space. Yeah, five grand. Oh, all right, then. Facts and figures about pilots and UFOs. Full page ad. We don't, need a, we don't need reporters then to give us a bit of a nice story. Let's just put it in there. But even if they go, oh, um, ooh, Jesus, uh, can't put this in, uh, we're refusing you. What will have happened is, I will have sent an email and say I want to put a full page added. Whoa, yes, thanks very much for that five grand. 
Ooh, don't like that. We're refusing you. In documentary evidence. Why are you refusing me? Uh, I can't really say. Another email comes back. What does it create? It creates a paper chain of negativity. That's documentary evidence that you can print off in a court of law. This is the email that I sent to the Times and I said, yeah, we won your £5,000. And then we went back and said, oh, we're not putting that in. What, are you turning down £5,000? Yes. But it creates a paper, auditable paper chain, documentary evidence that we put in a court of law. So we can affect change, because even those negatives we can turn into a positive. Because they can say, look, there's the emails, we can print these all out all day long, they're turning us down, the war letters, this proves suppression. What a way to prove suppression. And that's just one of the ways that we could do it. We could do road shows. We could really start to, if everybody built into the idea of just giving 35 pence a week, it's so much. Do you see what I mean? We could have millions of people buying into this concept. I ain't bothered about the money whatsoever. I want to make a change. And we have it within ourselves to actually do that. If we can only grasp the nettle. And in reality, that is down to you people. I can't make you subscribe. I can't make you buy into this idea. But an idea has to start somewhere. And all the top researchers are on board with this. So what are you waiting for? You can sit there in your ivory towers and go, oh, there's never going to be disclosure. There's never going to be this. Oh, government. All these armchair millions, they all criticise people left, right and centre. But they're not prepared to do anything about it. But we have it within us ourselves to affect change if we can only get that message across. So it's a Sunday morning. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Let's have a great subscribe. For just <laughs> that was absolutely brilliant, Gary. Yes, I've noticed the change from the 90s to the present day. You're right about older people being more observant. I think the younger generation, due to the internet, they do see it, but they've accepted it. And they don't, they don't question it. Absolutely, they're just Because happy. that's to them, that's just something that happens. Okay? And as you say, in the 90s, Michael Hesselman, he used to have 1,500 people at conferences. The UFO conference, while I was there, 1,500 people. Yep. You shocked me when you said there was about 700 on the last one. The last one? Good there. Uh, yep. Okay? So I've, I agree with the way Gary's put this together, ladies and gentlemen. And we have to become messengers. Try to push the point a little bit more. And we're to donate and join his magazine. Is that a promise? Come on. <laughs> Gary, you did a brilliant job. And just keep up the good work, and I personally will send you some of my information. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Now, the next person. Right, we're knowledge, knowledge, comprehension of knowledge, taking knowledge and practice, knowledge here, knowledge in practice, and therefore direction for status.